Does anyone ever feel like they're not good enough? Yeah, anyone ever have them feelings like you're not good enough? Um, so, uh, real people, but I've changed the names to protect the innocent, right? But um, real people, uh, I know a bloke called Steve, yeah, who says to me, Duncan, I want to come to church, but I'm not good enough. I'm going to fix up my life first, and then I'll come to church. So he, he feels like he's not good enough, right? I'll tell you someone else, right? It's Sharon. Sharon goes to church, but she feels, and she believes in Jesus, but she feels like she's not good enough as well. And she's always thinking, boy, I'm a really bad person. I'm just not good enough. And then there's another guy I know called Dave. And Dave says, I'm good enough. <laughs> I don't need Jesus. I don't need the church. I'm pretty good. Right? And, then, and then there's me, and I find quite often, normally late at night when I'm trying to get asleep, I find myself thinking, ah, oh, I'm just so bad. Surely I should be better by now. After all these years of being a Christian, I should be a better person. Oh, I'm not good enough. And it, this is a common problem that we face where we feel like we're not good enough. So what we're going to do today is we're going to see what the Bible says about it in Matthew 22. But first, let me pray. Lord God, we come before you and ask that even though we're bad people that do bad things, that don't feel like we're good enough, we pray that as we study your word, what you've written in the Bible, that you would bless us with understanding, with clear minds, and that you would show us what you think about the matter, and that you would change our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at Matthew chapter 22, and we're going to read a parable that Jesus told. Now bear in mind that parables are not true stories, but they're stories that Jesus would tell to make a point. And so we're going to be reading this story and trying to see what is the point that Jesus is making. Bear in mind as well, this is 2,000 years ago, and Jesus is chatting to a crowd yeah, of Jewish people. Pharisees and scribes who really don't want anything to do with Jesus. They're a bit like Dave, really, who says, I am good. I don't need Jesus. And look what Jesus says. Matthew 22, verse 1. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. A quick question, who do you think the king is supposed to represent here? God, yeah, God, right? So God is the king and he prepares a wedding banquet for his son. Who's his son? Jesus, Jesus right. So Jesus is telling the story that's about what God the Father is preparing for Jesus. He's preparing a big wedding feast, which we know the Bible elsewhere talks about what happens at the end when Jesus comes back. There's basically a big wedding feast. There's a big party. And people who go to that party are people who end up living with God for eternity in the new heavens and new earth. So if you think this life is pretty rough now, don't worry, because if you believe in Jesus, there's this just wonderful place to be for eternity in the future. So verse 3, he sent his servants to those who have been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refuse to come. So who do you think Jesus is chatting about here? Who is it who refuses to come? People in general. Yeah, it's the people in general around. And the people who, are, who he's like directly chatting to are the people in his day and age, these Jewish Pharisees and scribes around him who have said, no, we don't want anything to do with Jesus. And in fact, they're actually planning to kill him. So verse 4. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. So this king's quite a generous guy, right? I mean, he sends out the invitations. All these people diss him and say, no, we're not going to go. And what he does is he invites them again. That's a very generous, kind king. But look what happens now. Verse 5. They paid no, what's it say? Attention. Attention. They paid no attention and went off. 
One to his field, another to his business. So th- these are people who are saying, no, we don't want him. We don't care about the king's son. We don't care about the party at the end. We're going off. But look at verse 6. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. Had anyone any idea what Jesus is referring to then? Yeah, so in the Old Testament, you had God's prophets would come and tell people, repent, turn to God. And sometimes the people would actually kill them. And then Jesus actually got a relative who has also been killed recently. John the Baptist, he's been killed as well. And Jesus is about to get killed. And this is what Jesus is chatting about. And so it says, the king, verse 7, the king was enraged. So now... The king is angry, and rightly so. You know, they've killed his servants, and they've refused to come to the wedding banquet of his son. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And interestingly, in AD 70, what terrible thing happened? Uh, Something that that happened in Jerusalem. AD 70. Yeah, Jerusalem was sacked, Roman soldiers came, destroyed Jerusalem. It was terrible what happened. It's one of the bloodiest things that has ever happened in a city. And that happened. You know, some people interpret that as that's God's judgment on the city where the people had Jesus killed. But the story's not over, right? Verse 8, then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Now, this is key, right? He says, those I invited did not deserve to come. The Greek word in the original manuscripts is axios, which is the word that can be translated as worthy. In other words, these guys weren't worthy to come to the feast. Now, why is it that they're not worthy? What is it they've done that shows they're not worthy? Yeah, yeah, and, and, so, and so they've refused to accept what God's got, right? That's, what, that's what's made them, I mean, you're exactly right, but you're saying stuff that I don't want to say for a few more minutes, but you're right. <laughs> yeah. So what they've done is they've refused to come to the party. They've said, we don't care about the king's son. We don't want to be at the king's son party. We are good enough, like my friend Dave. We're good enough. We don't need the king's son. And because of that, the king says they're not worthy. They don't deserve to come. Now, this is really key, right? Because remember earlier I asked us, does anyone ever feel like they're not good enough? Well, I want to show you here that really this, this is the only valid reason for not feeling good enough. In other words, if you find yourself saying, I don't want nothing to do with Jesus. I don't want nothing to do with God's son. I don't care about his party at the end. I don't want Jesus. If you feel that way, then if you feel you're not worthy, that you're not good enough, that you're not deserving, then that's true. But if, on the other hand, you actually find yourself thinking, I want Jesus. I want to be at the party at the end. I want to be there with the king's son, and I want to be there with the king. Then, that's a good sign that you are not one of the undeserving people. Which means that a lot of the time when we're feeling like we're unworthy, we're actually getting it twisted in our mind. If we actually love Jesus, then we're not unworthy. Because people who are unworthy are people who say, I don't want nothing to do with Jesus. So if you find yourself wanting Jesus, then that is a good sign that you are not unworthy. I know I use a lot of negatives there, so it's hard. I see some people being like, wait a minute, not, um, which way does that work? Okay, as we go through this, it will become clearer, I hope, by God's grace. Okay, uh, okay. so um, look what the king says in verse 9. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So we get an interesting idea of this king, right? He's quite a generous king. You know, it's like, 
go to Danbury Avenue, yeah? Anyone you find, invite them in. They can all come. That's the kind of king he is. You know, it's, before when we were reading it, we were probably thinking of all these respectable people being invited to the king's wedding. I mean, let's see a show of hands. Who's been invited to the royal wedding in a few weeks? Yeah, none of us lot, right? <laughs> right? And, but what we see here is the king says, hey, you know what? Go in the street corners. Pick up everyone. Yeah, and then it says here, uh, verse 10, so the servants went out into the streets and they gathered all the people they could find, and then it says both good and bad. It says both good and bad, yeah? Now check it out. In the Greek, it actually says both bad and good, which is a bit surprising, isn't it? It starts with the word bad, so it seems to be emphasizing bad. Go out Danbury Avenue and pick up all the bad people. Yeah? So this is really interesting. It seems that the king doesn't have a problem with bad people coming into his kingdom. Yeah? Now here, I think when he says good and bad, he means the way that society views people as good and bad. Yeah? So in Roehampton, or in the world, how do peop- what do people think bad people are? Poor people, uh, criminals, people who commit crimes, people who do antisocial behavior, people, people who do drugs, people who do a lot of the things that a lot of us in this room have done <laughs> in our lives. Bad people, right? And, and the king's saying, bring the bad people in. Now, this is interesting, because if you remember I said about Sharon. Sharon comes to church, she believes in Jesus, but she thinks but I'm not good enough. But someone needs to tell her that the king has invited bad people. <laughs> and he said, no, bad people can come in. But then we've got a problem, because you're like, how does that work? How, there's going to be this big party at the end, the king and his son, Jesus, are going to be having this big party, and bad people are going to be there. How on earth is that going to work? Because when you have a party, you normally don't invite the people that you know are going to turn your house upside down and mess everything up, Yeah. <laughs> you don't normally want that, okay? But God invites those people in. How on earth can that work? How can you have bad people in there? Well, let's have a look. Verse 10. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. So the king comes in. He sees all the people at the party. Does he say, oh, there's some bad people here? He doesn't. He doesn't say there's some bad people. He's told them to bring bad people in. So there's all these bad people in there. What is the one thing that he spots where he's like, oh? Someone who's <laughs> There's a bloke wearing his skivvies. Right, so there's one bloke there who's not in wedding clothes. Now, in that culture, when you turn up at a wedding, you would wear wedding clothes, especially if it's the king's wedding. And some people say, though it has been debated, but some people say that ancient kings would often provide wedding clothes for their guests. So it could be that the kings brought everyone in, good and bad, and he said, here's these robes to wear for the wedding. And the bad people are put on the robes, and the good people are put on the robes, and everyone's there looking good. And then there's this one guy there who that morning said, I'm not going to wear this. I don't need this robe. I'm fine as I am. And he turns up without the robe. And that is the problem. That is the thing that God spots. Now, here's a question. What is this robe? Because this is a parable, and the robe symbolizes something. Now, I'm going to take you to another bit of the Bible, to the Old Testament, that I think Jesus' listeners would have been aware of, the, the scribes and Pharisees would have. It's from a book called Zechariah. That I've put it up on the screen for you, because finding Zechariah is a mission. But I can see one guy there, like, trying to find it. Yeah. <laughs> we pray for you. <laughs> you might just find it. Well done if you do. Shout out bingo if you do. So in Zechariah chapter 3, right, here is a vision, okay? 
Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. And we know that that's what Satan means, right? The name Satan means accuser. And Satan loves to chat rubbish about God's people. He loves to say they're a terrible sinner. You know, and that might be one of the reasons why sometimes we find ourselves feeling I'm not good enough. Because we're being accused and we're listening to our accusations and being like, yeah, I'm not good enough. Well, look what happens here. Verse 2, the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is not, this a man, is, is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? So here he's saying to Satan, nah, this guy who you're accusing, he was in the fire. He was, he was so in the fire that he was burning. But what happened was I snatched him from the fire and now he's safe. So this is what God's saying. He was burning, but I snatched him from the fire. I saved him. Verse 3, now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. So you've got Joshua here standing there in front of God, and he's filthy. What do you think the filth represents? His sin. His sin, he's like us, he's a bad person. He commits sins all day long, every day of his life. Right? And, uh, and he's standing there filthy before God. He's not wearing the right clothes. Verse 4, the angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin and I will put rich garments on you. So he's saying, we've taken off your sin. Now we're going to clothe you in rich garments, the kind of garments that a king would give people for his son's wedding. Verse five, then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. So what you got here, right, is someone like us who's a sinner, right, who ain't wearing the right wedding clothes, yeah? And then what God does is God puts on a nice white robe, nicer than this one, puts on a white robe, right? And is then like, now you can stand before God, you're dressed the right way. Okay, now if we go back to, to Matthew, to this parable, all the good and bad people are wearing the white robe. They're wearing the white robe, so it doesn't matter that they're bad. They're clothed in this white robe where it looks like they have never sinned. Instead, they look like righteous people who have only done right things in their life. They're wearing this white robe. But there's this one guy who says, nah, I don't need this. I'm good enough on my own. A bit like my friend Dave. So, look how the king responds to this kind of attitude of the person who says, I don't need the robe. Verse 12, he says, friend... Now, by the way, the Greek word there for friend is not like an intimate word for friend. It's kind of like the friend where you don't know someone's name <laughs> and you say friend, you know, like where you go, mate, <laughs> you know, like what is that guy's name? You know, and there, there's a little bit of distance there. It's not, it's not like an unfriendly word, but it's not like brethren. Yeah, so God says friend. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, this is a, a, an image of hell. What the king is saying is this person cannot come into the party. He can't come into the new heavens and earth at the end. He can't be in heaven because he's not clothed the right way. He's a bad, bad, bad person who can't come to my party He'd turn my house upside down if he comes to my party. My party will not be a good party if he comes along. He needs to be clothed in the robe to come to my party. So, all these other people that are wearing white robes, is it because of anything special that they've done? No, check out the last verse, verse 14. Jesus says, 
For many are invited, but few are chosen. So in other words, God says to the whole world, come to my party. A lot of people say, no, we don't want it. Other people say, yeah, I'll come, but I'm not wearing your threads. I've got my own righteousness. I'm good enough. There's some people who are chosen, who God chooses and says, I'm going to clothe you with this white robe. You're a bad person, but I'm going to clothe you. I know you wouldn't be able to clothe yourself, but I'm going to do it for you. That's the kind of wonderful God he is. He chooses sinners like us, clothes us with righteousness. And that's what New Life Church is. New Life Church is not a bunch of really good people. We should have it on the sign outside. A hospital of sinners (laughs) who have been given a robe to wear. That's all we are. We're not good moral people. We're sinners who have been given a robe to wear. Now, if you want to learn more about this, on our website, we've got a DVD, uh, a video in the Essential series called Justified. And it explains this whole, whole thing. The posh theological term for it is justification. It's where you are declared not guilty in God's eyes. And you're declared righteous in God's eyes. And the only reason why is because you're clothed with Jesus' righteousness. The perfect life that Jesus lived, you're clothed in it so that when God looks at you, it looks as if you've done all the good things that Jesus has done. And this is wonderful news for people like me that often find themselves thinking, oh, I don't feel good enough. Because then what I can do is remember, hang on a minute, I'm clothed with Jesus' robe. So in God's eyes, I'm okay. It also means that for people like my mate Steve, who say, oh, I've got to get myself good before I come to church, we can tell them, no, you don't have to. All you, need, you just need Jesus' robe. <laughs> Ask Jesus to put his robe on you. That's all you need. Now, let me show you something in Acts 13, lastly, that will I'm not going to put on this screen this time because this is an easy one to find. So Acts 13, this is something that just makes it a bit clearer exactly what's going on with this robe. Okay. So Acts 13, verse 39. This is uh, Paul, right? A missionary in the first century. He says in Acts 13, verse 39, through him, in other words, through Jesus, everyone who believes is justified from everything he could not be justified from by the law of Moses. So, So Paul would actually tell people there, listen, By following the law of Moses, all those rules, do not murder, do not steal, do not kill. By following those rules, none of you are ever to be justified in God's sight. None of you are ever to to look like good people because all of you are broken and we've all told lies. We've all stolen things. Yeah, even the pen at work is still stealing. Yeah, God can't turn a blind eye to stuff like that. And so we've all broken the law. None of us can be justified in God's sight. And what Paul says, his message in verse 39 is, through him, everyone who believes is justified. So if you believe in Jesus Christ, you then are justified. You're then clothed in this white robe. Now check this out. We go down a few verses, right? Verse 45. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. I don't have it on the screen. So, when, uh, verse 45, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively about what Paul was saying. So these guys, they don't like what Paul's saying about being justified. They don't like the idea of being clothed in a white robe. Okay, and look what Paul says, verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first, since you reject it and do not consider yourselves 
worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. The Jews around Paul consider themselves not worthy. They were not axios, the Greek word. They were not deserving. Why were they not deserving? Because they didn't want the white robe of Jesus' righteousness. That's the only reason why anyone should leave here today feeling they're not worthy. The only reason is if you're going to say, I don't want Jesus' robe. Then it's legitimate to not feel worthy. But if you're going to say, you know what, I want the robe. I want the robe. I want Jesus' robe because I know I'm not a good person. Jesus, I want his robe. Then you don't need to feel unworthy. And whenever you find yourself feeling unworthy, you can think, ah, but I've got Jesus' robe. So what we're going to do now is just take a moment of silence where we can all pray to God in our heads and just, if you want, just say, God, will you clothe me with this robe? If you're already clothed with it, thank God for that and say, God, please remind me that I'm clothed with this robe. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for this robe that you will clothe anyone who believes in Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, that you sent Jesus to live a perfect life for his people and to die a perfect death to pay for the sins of his people. We thank you so much for your goodness and we pray, God, that you'd help us to remember that we've got your robe if we believe in Jesus. Help us, God, to not look to ourselves and our own works to think about whether we're worthy or not. But help us to look to what Jesus has done in his life and on the cross and look to the wonderful white robe that he's given us. And help us, God, to communicate this to other people in Roehampton and to be able to bring people in from the streets and to communicate to them that it ain't about being a good person. It's about being clothed with Christ's righteousness. Jesus Christ, the King of Kings who died and rose again. In Jesus' name, amen.